welcome to Clear Eyes, Full Hearts, a podcast presentation of Cadence 13 in association with Black Barrel Media and Ritual Productions. This is an episode-by-episode look at the award-winning TV show Friday Night Lights created by Peter Berg. I'm still Stacey Oristano, and I played Mindy Collette Riggins. And I'm still Derek Phillips, and I played Billy Riggins. The assumption is, of course, that you, our listeners, have already watched the show. But if you haven't already, please go watch Friday Night Lights, which is currently streaming on Netflix and Peacock TV, because there will be spoilers in our podcast. And still... Please, guys, check out the merch. That's right. Go check out our website designed by Eleanor Carez, who is at Eleanor Carez on Instagram. Our website is www.cleareyesfullheartspod.com. Once again, that's cleareyesfullheartspod.com. We still want to answer your fan questions, so email us what you want to know at cleareyesfullheartspod at gmail.com. Mine's not as good, guys. I'm sorry. I still like it, though. Today, season two, episode 14, Leave No One Behind, written by Aaron... Ross and Thomas, and directed by Dean White. Here's our NBC synopsis. Matt reaches a tough point where nothing seems to matter to him anymore, and Julie becomes jealous of Tammy's growing friendship with Tyra. And we have a powerhouse guest with us today, unit production manager from Friday Night Lights, Nan Bernstein. But before we chat with Nan, let's get into the highlights of this episode. Top of this episode, Mus Harrison is going through it. Although I do have to say this cold open gave me less anxiety than the prior couple of weeks. So thank you, FNO. Yes, but these writers definitely do get some kind of very sick joy out of taking dumps on Matt Saracen. I mean, they really <sighs> love to pile on this kid. Because the next scene, I don't even know if I can say it. Say what? Matt Saracen calls his art teacher a bitch. Yes. He does. And I'll be honest with you, I don't remember this. God. And my eyes went wide in that moment. I was like, oh, that just happened. Oh. Yeah. You don't expect that from little Maddie Saracen. That's yes. for sure. Matt's going to go through some things this episode is apparently what we're getting off the top. I got to tell you, Bria Grant playing Jean. I like this kid. This kid's got spunk. She's not afraid of Tyra, who seems to be about three times the height of her. And she's still just a freshman playing with the like bigger dogs here. I like her energy. I like her. I like her energy a lot too. And good on her for laying it out there in front of Tyra. I mean, it, that takes a lot of guts. And as you said, I mean, they did a wonderful job in casting Bria for this part. She's great in the role. But then on top of it, she plays a wonderful foil to Tyra. Not just in terms of how different they are as people, mm. you know what I mean? But then as you brought up, like the height situation, when they're standing there in the hallway, you can tell that our DP on this episode just literally was like, all right, let's get this in a wide shot and just show the actual height difference between these two. It was shocking to see and it. she's just standing her ground and I love it. Yeah. Yeah, she did not care at all. Okay, we're on the field and Coach is going through it a little bit. He's losing players left and right. And Coach Mack says to Coach Taylor after he's asked where Matt is, he says, Landry said he went home and I was desperate and I knew that it was coming. That coach would just turn to him with his puppy dog eyes and go, who's Landry? He did not. That moment did not happen. But here's something interesting about that moment. The reality is that the reason why Landry is on the sidelines in this episode and the reason why Landry is incapable of playing and they make up the storyline that he hurt himself, he tripped on a curb or something, I think they say. Mm-hmm, fell off a curb. The reality is that Jesse Plemons actually tore his ACL playing a pickup game of flag football with me, Joey Oglesby, who plays Guy Raston, Taylor Kitsch, and Scott Porter. And so Nan Bernstein, who we're going to have on later in the show, was not very happy with us for having this pickup football game. And after this, it was like, all right, no more flag football games on the football field. I'm not going to say whether we played flag football after this or not. What, are they going to do, fire you? Well, we definitely didn't play it on the actual football field anymore. So you're saying that it's your fault that we lost a player? No, technically I would say it was Taylor Kitsch's fault. <laughs> I'm going to totally throw Kitsch under the bus on this one. I love it. So Jesse had been playing quarterback for both teams, basically, because there were only like 10 of us out there. Oh, for your flag game? Yeah, okay. on flag football. And so Jesse was playing quarterback for both teams, if I remember correctly. And then at one point, Jesse was like, I want to play a little wide receiver. So he went out there at wide receiver and he's standing out there and Kitsch starts talking smack. He's like, you're going down, Plemons. I'm going to take you out. (laughs) Plemons takes one cut. Literally, he jukes one way and it was like, pop. Yes, that pop. We heard it and all of us were like, oh, dude, that's not good. He (laughs) immediately went down to the ground and Kitsch, instead of being like, dude, are you okay? was like, that's what happens, bro. That's oh, what happens. No. And all of us are like, no, dude, I think he's injured. It turns out, yeah, he had torn his ACL. We'd been playing for a good 
hour and a half at that point in time. I remember because I was a smoker back then and I was like, my lungs were burning. And there was a part of me that was like, good, I can take a little break now. The game that's played Mm -hmm. where he gets to make the really good play. That's in episode 15. It's 15. Yeah, and that's a stunt double. Is it really? Yeah. Because uh, we'll talk about it in the next episode, guys. But I thought I caught a moment where Jesse like turned her face to the camera so you could really see it was him, but it was fast. Maybe it wasn't. It might have been him in the football uniform, but any time that there was running, it was definitely a stunt double after this because Jesse was banged up. You guys, when you sign a contract to be on a show, there's a clause in there that's like, you're not supposed to do anything too dangerous. And now Apparently, flag football is on the list of, it's more like, you know, skydiving. Well, there's another moment in this episode in particular, and it's cool that we're going to have Nan Bernstein on this episode because there's a scene where Saracen is on this motorcycle and he's, his car is broken mm. down. Like, as we said at the start of the episode, Saracen's got a lot of crap going on, but his car breaks down and he's debating getting a motorcycle. And so in this scene, it reminded me once again of like, Kitch and I both had motorcycles when we were working I on know. Friday Night Lights. And I remember showing up to set one day on my bike and Kitch was on his bike. Actually, we were leaving set and both of us are leaving set and Nan came running out and she goes, what? No, 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 no. And both of us are revving our bikes. Yep. Like we can't hear you, Nan. You know what I mean? But Nan was like, <laughs> no motorcycles. You cannot be on motorcycles. You're going to get yourselves killed. In hindsight, it makes complete and total sense. Yes. I mean, I'm sitting there watching Matt Saracen get on the motorcycle going, what are you doing, idiot? You're quarterback of the Dillon Panthers. You can't be yeah. riding a motorcycle. Meanwhile, Kitch and I were both riding motorcycles. And Kyle. Can you imagine with her job getting everything insured? She's the onset mom. She just wants yeah. us to like wear helmets and go home and sit on a couch when we're not at work. And that's absolutely what we should probably do. So Kitch and I, of course, it's not like we stopped riding bikes, but we stopped bringing them to set. And you maybe didn't rev him in the face of our boss. Oh, poor man. (laughs) She's going to be on later. She'll have plenty of stories. We've been named through the ringer. I think this is maybe the first time I've seen this happen, but Coach tells Tammy a little insight about Julie and what's going on with her. And he's like, Julie's having a little bit of trouble with this volleyball thing. And I was like, that's so insightful that he's noticing that his daughter is doing this and not the mother. I like the switch. I do too. Like, of course, because it's our show. Maddie's going to look at a motorcycle and Riggins drives by. Like, of course it happens. It made my heart happy. Riggins apparently always skips Wednesdays. It was just a great line. I always skip Wednesdays. I always skip Wednesdays. (laughs) Makes sense though. It really was like the worst because it's like, it's the middle and there's still two days left and it's like, It's a shame that this season is coming to a close because we're starting to get some of those Riggins-isms that start to happen. And I think he really comes alive in like season three. There's some great stuff. I just watched the first scene from season three and I'm not going to spoil anything because I know we're still on season two, but it just had me cackling. We'll get to that though. Well, we I'm excited there. about that. I think I wrote it down a little later in this episode. I laughed out loud three times. I'll like internally be like, oh, that was funny, but I don't laugh out loud at a lot of things, but three times in this episode and it was nice. Like there's still heavy stuff happening, but there was just a little bit of levity that I was like, oh God, thank you. But also just people making really good choices. Tonally, this episode feels different than the rest of season two. It really does. does. Not only does it feel different from the rest of season two, but it also feels a lot like season one. And it works. I got done watching this episode and I literally went on IMDb and I was like, I wonder what the ratings are on this episode. Because this is my favorite episode of season two. Agree. And sure enough, I think the fans at home agreed because it has the highest rating of any episode in season two. Very interesting. So we're not alone in that. We're not alone. I like that we agree too. Saracen, they're drinking their beers. Riggins is taking him on a journey and he just says, no, I'm not done being dumped. And you know what? (laughs) I've been there. Maddie, drink that beer. You've earned that (laughs) illegal beer. You're a terrible influence. Don't you know when you're like, no, I'm not done. Yes. I'm not done yet. Yes. This feels terrible. (laughs) We've all been there. Oh, Maddie. Did you ever in high school go to a party at a teacher's house? (laughs) No. (laughs) That was bonkers to me. I didn't even know where my teachers lived. It was a weird thing growing up. Like I knew my drama teacher was married. You know what I mean? And we knew that she didn't have kids and we were constantly like, what's going on? David shooting blanks. We were terrible. Oh, that's nice. No, we were terrible. They wound up having kids. Now as an adult, I feel awful about it. But at 15, I thought it was really cute, funny. But no, I had no clue where my teachers lived. I guess in no. college, like maybe we had some dinners at some professor's yes, houses. at professor's Especially houses like did. as a theater major, because it's a close-knit situation. You're doing a play. But no, not in high school. 
this girl that played Charity, my stripper friend, Chastity, the minute I showed up on set, she was so fun, so down to play, was bringing ideas, was bringing improv. That scene with Zach and Taylor and that friend was so incredibly fun. Even like, you know, putting that incredibly disgusting dirty dollar into <laughs> our mouths. Cool boy. You got a great line in this scene because there's an older gentleman who's in the club and he reaches out to grab you or he does grab you. Mm-hmm, yes. He says, hey, why are you paying all of the attention to these guys and not to me or whatever? And you go, because they're younger and they don't need Viagra. And that was a line that had me cackle. I did not make that up. That was written for me and I enjoyed it. And I said it every time. <laughs> Michael Waxman, DP of this one, whenever we were shooting in the club was just very paternal with me and with Chastity and with all the girls. And he would just take me aside and he'd be like, you good? Everything good? And I'm like, no, this is great. The guy and I have talked. He's very respectful. Everything's going really well. It was just always so supported and friendly. I think you said Michael Waxman DP, but I think you meant AD. Oh, I did. I'm sorry. Hi, Todd. Yeah. I didn't mean you. I am on <laughs> it today. Don't listen to anything I say. Do you remember? I think it was less or a couple episodes ago that we told it that Derek's always right and I'm always wrong. So like, that's not true. a lie. Well, I just look for the errors, Stacey. I, I'm just constantly looking for your mistakes. Welcome to the error. That is me. Okay. So <laughs> this was a while ago and I still remember that none of us really had, or maybe some fancy people had a first generation iPhone, but when Zach takes his phone to look at the message, the phone is upside down and it wouldn't yep. be what it was supposed to be because I think he had a Blackberry. I had a Pebble that he used to make fun of all the time, but like none of us were that fancy yet. I had a Palm Trio and I thought I was the Mac Daddy. I thought I was so cool Ballin! with my Palm Trio. Yeah, but I remember when Kitsch got a Blackberry and then he had a hookup with the Blackberry people. And so he was getting like a new Blackberry like every other month. And I was like, what is going on? I want to play Brick Breaker. Come on, man. But I didn't get my first iPhone until the end of the show. I think it was 2010. I purposefully didn't because they terrified me. I was like, but aren't you just going to get like finger smudges all over your phone? Which like, yeah, I guess what you do. Yeah. And I was like, how do you type on it? Doesn't make any sense. Yeah. I don't understand. Not a keyboard? Not a keyboard? Is stupid. And yet here we are. <laughs> Smash uh, scholarship rescinded. This is soul crushing to me. This happened to a really good friend of mine because he did. He got in a fight in a bar and accidentally like a beer bottle broke and somebody got hurt. He got his scholarship taken away and he went to go play football in Canada instead. It happens, man. And it's awful. A kid's whole entire life ruined because of something like that. Because it does become like a downward spiral. Oh, and he's sitting there just crying, looking at all the dreams and hopes he had on his wall and oi, oi, oi. Yeah. Meanwhile, this scene with Landry outside of the Alamo Draft House, which is where we used to all watch movies when we were living in Austin. And another cool thing about this scene in particular, while he's walking out of the movie theater with Bria, is that if you look behind them, playing on the marquee, you've got Jaws and Kingdom. Kingdom was, of course, <gasps> directed by Peter Berg. I didn't notice that. I did. Brooke Langdon got cast in Kingdom. And I think her part wound up getting cut. And because of that, Pete Berg was like, I'm going to make it up to you. And I think that's how Brooke wound up on Friday Night Lights. Oh, hey, well, there you go. It did make me giggle that I was like, oh, Dylan has an Alamo Draft House. Dylan's mm-hmm. fancier than I thought. I Very love fancy. Alamo Draft House. My favorite movie theater. Absolutely. Going to give a heck yeah to Coach for telling Matt exactly what it is, shoving him in the water, getting him to wake up, but then also... My God, Zach Guilford is a good actor. Yeah. You just get these. We had a couple before like singing grandma out and he has these moments, but you give that guy just base good material. He will tear it apart. He's yeah. so good. This is one of my favorite scenes in the history of Friday Night Lights. Is it? Yeah, because I remember somebody, I think we had a fan question early on where somebody had asked what your favorite scenes are. And I said, there's so many, but ones that like pop up in my head, this one's right up there. Because I'd never seen it. So I think maybe you did and I didn't know what you were talking about. It's such an iconic scene. And it's so well acted by both of them. And then it's just what we always talk about, all the elements coming together. Good writing always surprises you. And Mm. I think that we do think in the beginning, coach is going to do exactly what Matt says he's going to do. It's going to give him some stupid coach dad talk. That's what we think is going to happen. And the Mm -hmm. minute coach puts hands on him, you're like, whoa, 
I did not expect that. And he drags him down the hall and you're like, what is he doing? And throws him into that bathtub and turns that water on to sober him up. I don't think any of us saw that coming. No. And then the other twist that happens is Matt having this emotional breakdown. And he's right. He has been abandoned. He's been abandoned by Julie. He's been abandoned by Coach. He's been abandoned by his father. And then Carlotta. His mom. His mom, yeah. Everybody Carlotta. Everybody has him. left him. And Julie. I mean, when Coach says, there's nothing wrong with you, son. There's nothing wrong. I mean, I was waterworks. God, it was good. My God. Whew. Sorry, got to compose myself. Question. I'm not like poking the bear. I really don't know. Am I supposed to be pro Tyra Landry? Like if people were watching this for the first time on NBC, were they like, oh, thank God it's finally happening. They're together and kissing because I'm not. You know, I don't know if from a writer's standpoint, that's what they were going for originally. But I can tell you this much. In just the two episodes that Bria was on, you kind of fall in love with her. I know. See, I felt so bad for Jean because she's yeah. such a cool chick. She's a cool chick and you're going, yeah, this is who's right for Lance. They like the same weird music yeah. and they're smart and, and a little goofy. They make sense to me. It makes me sad. It's tough because, I mean, we've also become so connected to Tyra and Landry being together, but they cast the right person because Bria just knocks it out of the park. God bless her. Bria would be fine. She would go on to do the show Heroes. So all is okay with the world. But I was I'm pretty like, sure oh. that this was her big springboard and why she mm -hmm. got Heroes. Yeah, she credits that. Again, like maybe that's what it is, though. Feelings are complicated. It's not always perfect. But like, no, F and L making me fall in love with somebody and then life gets messy. Yeah. And it gets messy real, real quickly. I know how the show ends. And there's a part of me that goes, you know what? Maybe he did make a mistake here. Maybe. I mean, life is not that simple. There are definitely ones that get away. And especially when you're like 17. I have a one that got away from high school. I'm 46 years old and single. So there are definitely some ones that I think might have gotten away. I have won. Well, in high school one. But still, I'm like, I should have. We would be married by now. Hmm. He knows who he is too. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> you guys. Yeah. smash coming into the locker room. He can't play. It's illegal. Like, stop this. And then I was like, oh, he's probably going to make a speech, isn't he? Started making a speech. And then the little goosebumpy started happening on my skin. And I was like, Brandy Lights doing it again. So good. It wasn't even the speech so much that got me is all the players exiting the locker room. And then the camera just stuck there on Smash by himself. And he's solid. He's firm. He's sent him off to go fight their battle. And he breaks down in that locker room. And I, once again, found myself breaking down. Maybe my favorite ending to an episode. That one and the one where Jesse walks into the interrogation room, but just watching our, like, heroes. I kind of feel like maybe it was written that it just ends on him and Gaius made that choice to break. Definitely possible. It feels very Gaius to me. I know I may get flack from some of you guys for this, but I'm going to say it again. This is my favorite episode of season two. The reason I feel that way is because tonally, it feels like season one again. Yeah. You got all the elements that make Friday Night Lights a great show. You've got football, relationships, small town, strippers. You got strippers. Humor. Humor. Humor is the biggest thing. I was trying to be light by saying strippers, but like the reality is that is what it is. There's humor again. Yeah. This episode made me be like, oh, yes. I do love you, Friday Night Lights. You've, you've never been bad, but this is why I was stuck. Yeah, it's making me more excited for the start of season three. I was thinking about it today as I was walking my dog to the park. If I had to go in order of like what my favorite seasons of Friday Night Lights. Mm -hmm. One has a special place in my heart just because it was season one and it was all new and blah, 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 blah. But in terms of quality episodes, and there are amazing episodes in season one. But in terms yep. of an overall season, I think three, four, and five are the strongest. Really? Yeah. I go three, five, one, four, two. You haven't even seen the show yet. But I know three, four, and five because I was in them. <laughs> it's all about me. Oh, boy. All right. We're going to have Nan Bernstein on, so please stick around. We are thrilled to have the multi-talented wearer of many hats, Nan Bernstein, on the show with us today. Nan is an award-winning motion picture and TV unit production manager and producer. She's worked on a variety of feature films, including Conspiracy Theory, Michael Collins, The Flamingo Kid, and It Takes Two. Her television work includes such series as I'm Dying Up Here, Aquarius, The Leftovers, Parenthood, Prime Suspect, Mr. Robot, Dirty John, Physical, and of course, Friday Night Lights, which earned her an Emmy nomination. Over the course of her career, she's had the opportunity to work with such names as Johnny Cash, Julia Roberts, Sophia Loren, Mel Gibson, 
Christian Slater, Annette Benning, Rami Malik, Michael Afted, Brett Ratner, Kenneth Lonergan, Damon Lindelof, and of course, Peter Burr. For those of you who don't know, Nan was the glue that held Friday Night Lights together. And if it weren't for her, this show probably would not have survived five seasons. So with that being said, Nan Bernstein, welcome to the show. Thank you. How did you get into the movie and television business? On the very bottom rung, (laughs) I was in social work school. And I thought oh, I could do this when I'm older and was broke up a relationship. And my sister drove me to New York and sort of literally dumped me on the street. And I thought, well, I want to work in entertainment, but I didn't know what I was talking about. And I thought, let's try movies. And I Xerox yellow pages. And I just started knocking on doors. And one day I was sitting in a diner and I heard these guys in a very high booth talking about a movie. And it was with Susan Sarandon and David Steinberg. And I walked around the corner and I said, sorry for eavesdropping, but do you need any help? I can type really, really well. It was then IBM Selectric, typey, typey, type. And they said, come up after lunch. So I did. And I was the production secretary on that job. And then just through confluence of people moving up and people needing to be fired and the coordinator ended up being the second AD, she said, can you coordinate this? I didn't even know what dailies meant then. There's no question that's stupid. Just ask a question. So then they took me to California to do post-production and I started being interested in location managing because I felt that location managing and understanding what a character is to locations and difficulty of getting in and out in your day was kind of the first step in the design process. And so I location managed for about 11 years all over the place, Florida, Vermont, Massachusetts, New York, but you cannot stay too long at any fair. So then I started production managing on shows. The first thing I did was a documentary called The Making of Tootsie, which won an International City Award. Never had done a doc before and the director only wanted me. I couldn't understand why. And I said, I'm not in the director's guild. He said, don't worry about it. We'll get you in. So I got in the director's guild and just started working. And about 10 years, ago, maybe more, started producing. For a lot of us at home, and myself included, I'm just an actor. Mm -hmm. I don't know a lot of this stuff behind the scenes. What exactly is it that a unit production manager does? What exactly? I mean, they sometimes refer to it as a line producer, correct? Or is that a different title? I hate that term. I don't know what that term means. It's like you're the last person on the line before you're below the line. But Mm -hmm. I really am trying to get people to get away from that title. I don't know what it means. I kind of define myself as a general contractor. Mm -hmm. If you're building a house, you have to make sure that the electric goes in, the plumbing goes in before the walls go up. And I have a very good spidey sense about crew. I don't ask a lot of people what they think. I just meet people and I get a sense of them and I go, yep, that's going to be the sound mixer. Yep, that's going to be the so-and-so. And And they're not always the same people. I have worked with the same people over time, but randomly and it depended where the show was. But Friday Night Lights, I was determined to be as local as humanly possible. Hmm. And everyone's like, well, you're not going to find assistant directors there. And you're not going to, I said, don't say what I'm not going to (laughs) do. And I looked in the Director's Guild book under all the assistant directors in Texas and started calling people. And I realized Michael Waxman was there, who was Michael Mann's AD and producer. I called him and said, hey, do you want to come meet me? I'm doing this show in Austin. He lived a little south of Austin. And he said, sure. And he came and met me. And I said, it's a scale job. And he said, why make more than double that? And I said, I don't know what to say about that, on that scale. And I said, but how many times in your life will you be near your two teenage daughters and be able to drive home at night and be home with them? And he came back for a second interview and he said, I'll do it. And I said, I can't guarantee this, but I have a feeling something really good's going to come for you from this. And he ended up directing and he's becoming a producing director. And I think we brought in very few people on the show. Yeah. Well, we had Michael on the show already and we talked about that. I mean, one of the perks for Waxman on this show was the fact that he was going to get the opportunity to direct. And as it turned out, not only did he get the opportunity to direct, he basically wound up becoming the directing showrunner for the last three seasons of the show, Mm -hmm. two seasons of the show. He didn't know that in the beginning. Yeah. I'll be home and seem like an interesting show. He decided to say yes. And that's a huge get. I mean, a guy with Michael Waxman's credits yeah. and his resume, I mean, that's a pretty big get on your part. 
And, and I, I knew mean, him. He was doing When Harry Met Sally and I was doing some other movie then. And we knew each other in New York, but we were always on different shows at the same mm-hmm. time. But he knew me and I knew him. So when I called him, it wasn't like a completely cold call. It was just a completely cold cash get. <laughs> how did you wind up becoming a part of Friday Night Lights? I mean, um, we know how you got most of us and most of our crew, but how did you become a part? My agent sent me to meet with Pete. Mm -hmm. And we just kind of clicked. And I think he took a big flyer on me. And I had known people at NBC. I'd worked there before. And between the two, he was like, yep, do the show. So it was really just going in and talking to him. Sort of like I meet crew. He had a feeling. And we went forward from there. I can't speak enough to the crew that you guys put together. As audience, I don't know if you guys... I mean, there are so many components that go into making a television show. It's compared a lot of times to like a clock. And if there's one one piece in that wheel that's not working, the whole entire thing can shut down. So it really is a testament to you and Peter Berg in terms of the crew that you put together. I mean, it always felt like a well-oiled machine. Now, from your perspective, it's very different than my perspective as an actor. I always was just impressed with the way things were working. But I know that there were adjustments that had to be made along the way and certain people moved out and certain people brought in. And Mm -hmm. Can you speak to that a little bit? What was interesting about it is Pete has a very unique way of working. And I think more people should adopt it. When you location scout, I'll pick the place you want to be. But when you go back with the tech crew, which is the grip, the gaffer, the camera people, props, and everybody to look at the location, he really doesn't spend a lot of time there because I think he didn't say this to me, but my feeling was he likes to go into a place. And if it's a rainy day, you have one vibe and you may position people in the house in a certain way. If it's a beautiful, sunny day, the house may have a different vibe. So he doesn't want everybody going, oh, where do you want to put the camera? As much as it could have been a documentary, Mm -hmm. the faster we moved and the less specificity that people made him commit to and they got married to, the better the show went. Yeah. And on the pilot, I learned that in a breakfast scene, he didn't want to reset to wait for the scrambled eggs, the toast and the bacon to be given to the kids. And there was a whole thing with a coffee cup being stolen by the kid. And he's like, just give her the food, give her the food. And the prop people, are, there's nothing on the plate. So there were people lying on the floor that just like put the eggs on, put the bacon on, it, hand the new plate. And it allowed you to move through the scene without this downtime. And a lot of people would say, oh, we want to shoot that like Friday Night Lights. But there's a lot of giving up of control when you have three cameras and sometimes you're in a space that can barely fit one camera. We would always figure it out, take a window out. I remember a bathroom scene. The bathroom was as big as a dining room table. We had one person with the window out in the bathroom, one on the floor and one in the bathtub with character. And the operators would find the most interesting places to tuck themselves and find the scene. And there were moments that ended up in the cuts that were the emotional moments, but the operators found them because you can't tell each camera exactly what to do. And I got very passionate about that style. A lot of people don't know how to ascribe to it because it's a little bit of loss of control, but I really understood what Pete was doing. On all levels, it's a very organic way to shoot. And one of the things that I loved about it, we were talking about just now, that the operators having so much freedom. There's a certain amount of artistry that I think comes into it because you're not being told exactly what to shoot and where to shoot it. There's a certain amount of each person, whether it's the actor, whether it's the costumer, whether it's the DP lighting the scene, there's a sense of ownership from every single person that's on this crew because there's a sense of artistry that's being brought to it. I know personally as an actor, there's been numerous sets that I've worked on where the minute you show up, they go, okay, so we're going to have you guys standing here. You're going to get up on this line. You're going to walk mm-hmm. over. You're going to go to the fridge. You're going to open the fridge on this line. You're going to grab this beer out. You're going to come walk over. That never happened on it's Friday night. It's brain deadening. Yes, it, it is. Makes, you're thinking about not the totality of your character. You're thinking about, oh, I'm supposed to move there then because that camera's going to follow me there and it's a yeah. dollar shot now. And I got to hit this mark. Organized organic. It's not free for all. There was one scene we were shooting in our bedroom, you and me, Derek, and we were on the bed and I was looking mm-hmm. around and I was like, guys, there's only two cameras here. Is it just there's not enough space? Very slowly, the closet door opened and it was Heather (laughs) crouched in the corner and she was like, 
baptized days. And then she like closed <laughs> the closet door and I was like, oh my God. There are always wonderful little moments like that on the show though. Yeah. Where, I mean, we called the camera operators snipers because we really didn't know where they were <laughs> half the time. And it's very rare when you're working on a television or film set, you would go, hey, are we in a medium? Are we in a wide shot? Is this, is this, a is this my quarter, my close-up? It didn't, it didn't matter. matter. And I was very impressed with, in the morning, you'd see the operators sitting and reading the sides as if they had to perform. Mm -hmm. And they always read the sides and get into the character. And there are moments like where Connie had her arms around Amy and she's patting her back in a really emotional moment. The shot is her hand on the small of her back, just calming her down. That wasn't planned. That was an operator going, wow. That's, yep. a, That's moment. a C camera operator going, yep. there's Catching a moment, it. there's something. There's a moment. There. And it also requires an editor to say, oh, they found that moment. I'm sticking it in the show. It really does come from the top down. We knew when we came in about like, we didn't do last looks and like not so much with continuity, but like really it started so much further than before we even got to set from the top down, like what was created to make that space. It was magic. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was. And it was a learning process. Football was a whole different thing. We tried to do it with our three camera operators. That's what I was going to ask you. I believe that you told me this, that you brought on NFL camera operators? I did. Is this correct? Yes. The spiral going center frame and the coin flip, it's a science. It's people who do that all the time. Not that our camera operators couldn't learn it. Of course they could learn it. But one of the main guys said he used to stand in his backyard with a string on the football and just throw it and throw it and throw it to make sure that football stayed on the string and spiraled and plop out a center frame. And I thought, how do we fix this? How do we make football as real and exciting as possible? Well, you need to have real football shooters. So I called NFL and I said, can you tell me the names of your top five people? And they did. And I called and I had a vibe about a couple of them and said, do you want to come down and shoot football for us? We had all seven cameras out those nights, but we would do the A team first so they didn't have to stay all night. And then three cameras would leave and four football cameras would stay and do the more rough and tumble stunt-like scenes. Oh, man. We usually shot those football scenes on Fridays. Mm -hmm. Uh, So it really did feel like a Friday Night Lights kind of vibe. We'd all be sitting there watching the sunset. And the minute the sunset, we'd start shooting stuff. And those guys would go till five, six in the morning sometimes. We shot it down to about two or three in the morning. After a while, we really got it down. And Michael said to me, Nan, I want you to get a band for every football game. And I was like, Michael, we don't have the money to like have a high school band on every game. So I started donating money to the high school band instead of each individual. We had bands at every football game, which kept the background actors happier. It made it more exciting to be there instead of dead space having a band. Yeah. And it was exciting because you heard the music and it was like football music and it was just really good. The other thing was designing a camera car that was much more malleable than an insert car is. Yeah. And it was made out of a Toyota Sienna with Chapman seats. It just kind of came to me and the special effects guy, the grip and I kind of was like, let's build one. Yeah. And I don't know that you could use something like that in New York or LA that probably go, what is this? It's not safe. It <laughs> right. isn't Making a real camera car. No, it took up little space. Yeah. Like a camera car takes up a lane and a half and you have to surround yeah. yourself. This was just a van. Yeah. Oh. And it didn't take up any space. It could just drive along right with the actors. Oh. It is so interesting now to look at shows and like, I don't want to come from a place of ego, but I'm like, you guys took stuff from Friday Night Lights. And it seems like we had Ray Romano there at our Mm -hmm. wedding because he was looking to shoot for his new show. And then Parenthood, obviously, because it was the same people. But it seems to be like you guys started a movement of this like naturalistic shooting that really wasn't a thing before. It wasn't a thing before. Documentary style, fly Mm -hmm. on the wall kind of thing. 95% of the directors got it and embraced it. There were a few that really did not like that loss of control and that feeling of they couldn't control the words. And it was funny because one director, the more he was trying to put it in a box, the more Taylor and Scott messed with them. They yeah. just drove him crazy because the more he was saying, you know, just do this and stay there, the more they were just saying random things and funny things and it, it was making them crazy. But I said to him, what are you getting so angry about? Just let them do what we've been doing the past 
two and a half years. Exactly. Yeah. But yeah. some people can't. There were actors too that, that mm-hmm. came on the show and it was like, are you going to say that line? It's like, no, probably not. Uh, and, or and, am and I going to get last looks? And we're like, nope. nope. You could see the smoke starting to come out of their ears because yeah. they couldn't figure out that this is how this process works. Through like a paragraph of dialogue written and either Connie or Kyle would say, I wouldn't say that if my wife or husband said that to me. Mm-hmm. What would you say? Yep. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. that's what it was. Yep. Or, or I'd say nothing. Yeah. <laughs> right. I mean, as wonderful as Friday Night Lights was, that doesn't mean that there weren't hiccups. Nan could probably speak far better than I could about the ratings the first season and how close this show was to being canceled numerous times. Mm-hmm. Specifically, and we've talked about this before, in that first season, there was a local, I believe it was a Teamster strike, Nan? It was the second season, wasn't it? Second no, it was season was writer season. Strike. The, the Teamster struck and sort of blocked all the exits and entrances to where the crew could get in and out of, but there was one place they didn't block. And I knew that if we shut down and went along with it, the show would just go away because yeah. they didn't want to get into that mess. But if we got anything on film, it would be great. So people who probably only did student films, lugged cable, director made breakfast for props. The props were already in the car, so they were handed off and the crew stayed away. And we got unusable. Taylor and I grabbed flashlights and pulled our wardrobe out of the wardrobe Mm -hmm. truck, along with Brett Cullen. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I believe I pulled some wardrobe from somebody else's line because... Like Billy a dress or something? No, no, no. <laughs> like a shirt that I never got to wear. <laughs> Billy didn't have the best clothing, so I was like, ooh. No, he didn't have a lot of money. <laughs> but we got enough done that day that gave the studio and the local Teamster union enough time to talk it out. Yeah. So nothing was really usable for the show, but we didn't shut down. Now, isn't it true, and I believe that this is what happened, that NBC called and they were like, what the hell's going on, basically? Mm-hmm. And you had to say, nothing's going on. I said, <laughs> we're going to shoot today. And he said, how? I said, lots of ingenuity. We're just going to mm-hmm. figure it out, but we'll get something shot today. And he said, how are you going to do that? And I said, I don't know yet, but I'm figuring it out. And we did. People that had done stuff on like non-union movies and student movies that were in the production office and stuff all came out and helped. Here's a question, because what little producing I've done in my life has been for theater. And I will be honest with you, it is not my skill set. I think I'm good at putting people together. But when things start to fall apart like that, I am like a nervous wreck. So do you thrive in those kind of moments? What are you doing? Are you pulling hair out? No, I think it's a little mental illness, but I do thrive in those moments. I've had to figure out the weirdest things on film, like find two penguins in New York City to work on a movie and can you get them a hotel room? But I did. I got the penguins. I just call and call and call and call and my brain says yes. Everything I try to do that's a little outside the box, I think yes. Is it true that on conspiracy theory, you landed a helicopter in Union Square? Yes. The only film to ever do that and they will never allow it again. Not that any. How the hell did you guys do that? Well, they needed to go out to a field and practice the rappelling Mm -hmm. there. And then when we came with the FAA and all the safety people, they said, well, where's your safe landing zone? I said, what do you mean safe landing zone? They said, well, what if something goes wrong? Where are you going to put the helicopter down? I said, you mean here? They said, yeah. And we looked around and the northwest corner was big enough to land it. And the stunt coordinator and I said, well, I guess we'll land it here or we'll go back to the heliport. And then I thought we had to be out by 11 p.m. We had like 60 PAs in every doorway all around Union Square. And I said to them, wait a minute, if we have to be done by 11 and you're going to make us pull the ropes up and fly back to the heliport and come back to do the scene and you're asking me for a safe landing zone, why don't we just land it, pull them in, do it again? We'll be done in a third of the time. And they all looked at each other and was like, oh, she's kind of (laughs) right. What did you tell the neighbors? Because I mean, I lived in New York for six years. I'm Union Square. There's plenty of residential area over there. I mean, what the hell were neighbors thinking when there's a helicopter being landed? We wrote a letter. Fired it. In every doorway and made sure they were posted everywhere and then ripped them off telephone poles and stuff that night. But it went really well. I think we got done at like 10, 15. 
because we were able to do it a few times and get out of there. Unbelievable. One of the things I did want to talk to you about, and this is another thing, I mean, talking about curveballs and how you handle adversity. After the second season of the show, we've talked about this before on the show, that midway through the second season of the show, there was a national writer's strike. It wasn't our writers. It was writers across the country went on strike. And the show was basically shut down at episode 15. And so there were all these storylines in the second season that just kind of came to a close, specifically one that we've been talking a lot about this season, which is the Santiago storyline. Do you have any idea what the writers intended for the rest of the season? And why did Santiago not come back? I don't think there was any particular reason. I think sometimes in real life, people float in and float out. Everything doesn't need to be tied in a bow. And I think there were characters that came in and out. And it was, a, again, a very organic process. And if they couldn't really develop a storyline that integrated well or made total sense, it was just a moment in time. There was that person and then they went away. It was like the murder, which everyone hated. It was yeah. a bump in the road. And then it just kind of disappeared. It does feel as an audience member and as a person that was on the show that in some respects, the second season was like after the second season, it was just like a reboot. There's a lot of storylines in the second season that we just don't talk about at all, specifically right. murder right. and Santiago and things like that. So it seems like it was a bit of a reboot, which I'm fine with that. And I can live with it. But it didn't matter, though. It was no, like it didn't. a community. And in a community, you don't see everybody every day and all the time. Yeah. People yeah. come in and out of your life. So True. you were wrapping your arms around a community, not 10 actors and their stories. Parenthood was a little more controlled in that way. Yes. There were a lot more names in it, older names. And we weren't talking about a community. We we're talking about a family of multi generations. So it was yeah. more stayed in that way. But this was a town yeah. and rival towns. And when the Lions came up, and I was like, another football field? I barely got the one built in time. Yeah. And I was walking around and I thought this whole baseball field could probably be, and everybody was being a Dowdy Thomas and the mm-hmm. production designer was like, oh man, that's ridiculous. You can't fit it there. I said, I don't know. We can fit it there. Let the football coordinator tell me yes or no. So Justin Reamer said, yeah, it'll fit here if you just kind of skew it this way. So we made the back of the stands that were for the Panthers. It said gymnasium. Yeah. And it was supposed to be a rough and tumble poor or school. So the grass was horrible. And then over time, we kept fertilizing it, making it a little better and better. And the bleachers were half built. Week by week and day by day and month by month. A little better. And a little bit better. I mean, just the same way that the Lions did as a football team. We realized we weren't using the weight room a lot. Mm -hmm. So we split the field house in two. So part of it could be the Lions and part of it could be the Panthers. And everyone cared so much that every idea was embraced. If it was a prop person talking about a location and it was right, we'd go, yeah, let's go there. We had wonderful location managers and it's lucky to be in a city that you don't have to get a permit for every time you move. So we were able to move around very rapidly from neighborhood to neighborhood. I wanted to talk once again, real quickly, just about season two and that writer strike that happened because season three was a monumental change for the show. DirecTV Mm -hmm. came in and if I'm correct, basically our budget was cut in half or something like that. Every year they took a little out. Gotcha. Every year, a little bit of money was taken out. Under Armour was helpful a lot because when I called Nike, they said, everybody has to be a Nike. Everybody has to be a Nike. I said, that's not real. Some of the kids probably only can afford Champion and they go to Kmart and they said, well, that's what our deal is. And I called Under Armour and they were like, whatever, just make sure everything looks good. And we helped a lot financially and design wise. The costume designer helped with the uniforms a lot, but they knew better what they were doing than we did. And yeah. the colors, blue and white, and then red and white. Money was cut. And I think by the time Direct TV came in, it was probably the cheapest one hour on television then. I would think yeah. so. It seems to me that you are what I would call a problem solver in the greatest sense of the word. I don't know if you remember this, but in season five, I got very, very sick and had to go to the hospital and you found out about it. And I was going to fly back to LA to do a surgery. And you were like, no, 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 no. And you sent me to a specialist. And she was like, you need to go to the hospital right now. So I had to go have emergency surgery using your doctor you sent me to, but you also gave me my hotel room for an extra week when I wasn't working so that I could recoup in the hotel room. And 
honestly, if you hadn't done that, I wouldn't have made it on that plane ride. Essentially, you like kind of saved my life a little bit. I do that a lot. Yeah. I try to find goods and services in new places that when bad things happen, I know where to send people or how to do it. And I also feel part of having been a social worker is really helpful. I think the human part of this business has really gotten terrible. And I can't detach from the crew and the cast because Mm -hmm. that's my heart. And I will take care of anybody. If I have to go to a hotel room at four o'clock in the morning and drive somebody to the hospital and take their temperature and make sure I will do it. It's just part of the thing. I sort of said I could have been a fireman because (laughs) I can get up at three o'clock in the morning and be dressed and look like I slept And you're good at putting out fires. I mean, that's literally another part of the job. (laughs) I would say your analogy about a UPM being a general contractor is 100% on point, but also being a fireman. I mean, I think that that's a lot of what your job Mm -hmm. is, is little things pop up and you're taking care Mm -hmm. of it. You're taking care of all the things, department problems to actors having problems with each other. But with like no anxiety, you're like, I got this, guys, it's cool. I hold it inside. (laughs) Well, that's a good good. place for it. (laughs) Compartmentalizing my anxiety. See, people see you nervous. Mm -hmm. It's not going to help anybody. It's not going to help the crew if you're like looking at your watch every 10 minutes and thinking that, oh, we got to end this night or you're nervous about something's really wrong with somebody. You're cool as a cucumber. I also (laughs) read an interview that you were shooting something in Vermont, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, and of course they prepped in the winter and by spring is when we needed to snow an entire town. (laughs) So you got together with Bernie Sanders and saved five stories worth of snow. Is this correct? (laughs) <laughs> we just kept scooping it up. I had a nine acre meadow and I just kept with caterpillars piling up, piling it and putting snow reflectors on it. We bought all these snow reflectors. It was there in August. There was still snow left in August. And we had John Deere snow blowers and dump trucks and people were shoveling it. And on the rooftops, we used JetX foam and stuff like oh that. God. Yeah, we snowed the whole town and brought people their groceries in the back door so there wouldn't be footprints. I had to do that twice in Vermont. Unbelievable. So what's the craziest thing you had to do on Friday Night Lights? Because saving snow for August is pretty crazy. I don't know that there was anything that crazy. I think it was yeah. just managing the budget and the schedule because both were very aggressive. Yes. And I think Pete taught me a lot about that. In fact, I found it very challenging and exciting to work mm-hmm. that way. And other shows that were the way you had described, like you're going to stand there, we're going to do an over, we'll just go see your show. I'm sitting on, oh, it's just so boring. Yeah. And it loses something. Not that every show should be exactly like Friday Night Lights, but when people said, we want to shoot this like Friday Night Lights, and I describe what we did, they're like, oh, no, I don't think. Yeah. Eight hour days, eight day shoots, mm-hmm. multiple location moves. I remember one time when David Boyd was DPing, he wanted a minivan. And I said, fine, you can have a minivan. And he took sandbags and made three round pods in the minivan. And we were moving a pretty far location. And Dave's picking up the completely built three cameras and sticking them in these sandbag piles. And I said, why are you driving the cameras to the next location? That's really not your job. He said, Nan, by the time that camera truck gets up there, we'll be done and we'll be putting these cameras into the truck. And we're wrapping and the truck's coming up the hill. We would move locations and have second unit shooting on the drive there. I mean, Mm -hmm. things like that, that just, uh, it it blows my mind. We talk about it all the time. The sniper aspect of it with the camera operators. I remember during Mud Bowl and I've spoken about it. There's a scene where Taylor and I were sitting there, Derek and Taylor having a conversation. We had no clue that there was a camera rolling on us. And this happened all the time on Friday Night Lights. Mm -hmm. They'd be getting background stuff, what usually would be considered second unit material, while we were prepping to shoot a scene. And it was just Taylor and I sitting there having a conversation, two actors, one to another, and it ended up in the show. We had no clue that we were even on camera. I think in those moments where things are grabbed like that, it gives a show air. It's like you go from scene to scene to scene. They don't always stitch together so perfectly. I mean, they used it a lot in Breaking Bad with like time-lapse stuff to give the show movement and a time movement. This was more done because we used all these second unit shots that were organic and kinetic and moved the show forward, but nobody knew they were there. So there wasn't this cozy feeling about it. Felt like we were watching a documentary. As we said, I mean, organic is the word that keeps popping into mind. I remember there was an episode where Kyle was walking up to the Riggins house and he stepped in some dog poop. And on any other show on the planet, they would have been cut. 
Uh, somebody get out there and clean up that dog poop. Somebody would have been cleaning up the dog poop. They would have been washing Kyle's shoe off. And we'd have been broken for 30 minutes while this was taken care of. They'd have resodded the lawn. You know? right. and on Friday Night Lights, it was like, doesn't oh, man, matter. It just happens. Oh, the challenging thing was when Connie was going to have the baby. There was yeah. a whole thing going on about getting an automatonic baby. So I said, I think I can get a real baby. And they were like, how are you going to get a real baby? Well, I thought if I got a preemie <laughs> that at six months old, it would still only be about six or seven. Months. You a premature child? So I found triplets. Yeah. And we had triplets there, but only one of them was beloved by Kyle. And she grew you're, up on the you're show. You're not the first person to say that. Yeah. Yeah, she, he would look at one of them and go, this isn't bad. Madeline. But one time I remember it was a baby who was in a high chair eating or whatever people did to keep it comfortable. And his line was, where did I put my car keys? And all of a sudden she said, I don't know. And she talked. Oh, great. And I thought, hey, player now. <laughs> oh, Lord. Did you have to go and try and uh, negotiate a contract? No, I did pay her a <laughs> I love it. She renegotiated that contract on site. Yep. Go, Grace. <laughs> and then one day she had to go to the bathroom and we were rolling and she walks into the bathroom and pulls the pants out and the AD looked at me and goes, should I cut? And I was like, yes, cut. <laughs> yeah, definitely cut. That's a uh, pretty crazy moment. I'm going to let you go after this, but we had a fan question a couple weeks back and they were asking, what happened to all the production vehicles when Friday Night Lights wrapped. So Reagan's truck and Coach's Blazer and all those cars Most that were used. Were rented. There's a whole okay. thing with pink slips now because they used to disappear. And now mm. if you buy a car, usually the company or the accounting department holds the pink slips in a safe. A lot of them were rented. Yeah the season. And there's usually a car coordinator that wrangles them for you. Sometimes we buy them and then sell them at the end. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like fancier cars, like on Sopranos, the Range Rovers, there were triples. Yeah. Well, thank God you do what you do because we wouldn't have been around for five years if it weren't There's no way we get five seasons without you. Thank you very much. I loved it. It sits in my heart in a very special place, that show. That is it for season two, episode 14. But please join us next week for episode 15 entitled May the Best Man Win. We've got a very special guest with us next week. Oscar nominee Jesse Plemons is going to be on the show. But until then, clear eyes. Full hearts. Can't lose. Clear Eyes, Full Hearts is a podcast presentation of Cadence 13 in association with Black Barrel Media and Ritual Productions. Executive producers are Stacey Oristano and Derek Phillips, Chris and Mandy Wimmer for Black Barrel Media, and Steve Walters for Ritual Productions. Our producer is Miranda Parham. Send your questions to clearEyesFullHeartsPod at gmail.com. Find us on social media. I'm Stacey Oristano on Twitter and Instagram. And I'm at Derek Phillips on Twitter and underscore Derek Phillips on Instagram. And check out our websites, ClearEyesFullHeartsPod.com, Cadence13.com, and BlackBarrelMedia.com. Thank you guys for listening, and we'll see you next week.